Well, I think probably this is our whole group for today. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I'll mention, I know there'll be people watching later in recording. So I want to welcome you all too. And however you get to be a part of our classes, we're glad to have you. Um, I will mention this morning that I came in, I've come into this class with a great deal of trepidation, a little bit of nervousness, because we are talking about really what has been um, a long, long standing, it's not a new controversy, but a long standing um, controversy about where is our home as Jews? Is it in diaspora? Is it in Israel? Um, that question and all of the unpacking of that, there's a lot of emotion there, and it really hits some some difficult issues. And so I'm I'm coming into that with 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 that nervousness and with that also a sense of gravity of realizing that these are important issues. And I actually I reached out to my reform rabbi to talk about it a little bit. I explained to her about the class, but also I told I also talked to her specifically because she and I have different points of view about Israel, Palestine, and related issues. And so I thought maybe she would be a good person to help me to unpack some of these things because she and I don't see eye to eye. And one thing she suggested to me was um, that before we enter into this conversation, she gave me a couple of suggestions of some videos that specifically deal with the question of how do you have good dialogue and how do you engage in in dialogue Jewishly. So we're going to watch those in a little bit, but f and before we get into the main heart of the discussion for today. But before we do that, we do need to go do a few housekeeping things. So first of all, I want to mention that uh, we are actually nearing the end of this year. Um, our class, Humanistic Judaism 101, runs through Rosh Hashanah, so we have a few more months, but we are reaching the end. And so I wanted to mention that now for us to be thinking about as a community, what do we want to do to continue learning? Do we want to have a follow up to this class? And if so, what would be some of the topics we would want discussed? What are things that especially for each of you as you're growing in your Jewish journeys, wherever they are, what would be meaningful to you? What would be important to you? So if you have a chance, email us and probably the easiest things, email either Martin or myself or email the Spinoza Haver at gmail.com email address. And especially one, would you be interested in a follow-up class? And secondly, what are topics you would like to see covered in that class? Uh, it would just be very helpful because I really would like um, for us to be thinking about it. We really need to start thinking about it now if we're going to do a follow-up class. I don't Another think I have the capacity to commit for to a follow-up class given everything I'm doing, but I would be open to it a forum, like keeping the forum open so people can asynchronously you know, write things in the, you mm -hmm. know, in the, you know, and I won't say anything else, but I know you want, you don't want to take up to this time with it, but I'll email about that. Oh, that's a great idea. Well, and another option is we might, instead of doing a full year long follow-up class, we might do instead a series of shorter classes. So that maybe for folks to say, I can only commit to four sessions, then we could do there's, there's a lot of different options, but we just want to hear from you all as, as students what would be best for you. And also, if there's any topics in particular you might be interested in presenting on, that's also a possibility as well. Uh, Martin and I are not the only people that can teach on these topics. And so if there's a topic you're thinking, oh, this is this is my issue. I really could speak on this. Then let us know and we can see if we can work that out. So that's the first housekeeping thing. Second housekeeping thing I'll mention is, is that I know at least a few people in our class and actually actually several on the report who will be watching later recording are taking this class as a step towards becoming Jewish. And so if you're if you're doing that through the Spinoza Habra, uh, Martin and I and Paul and Betty Ann, our leadership team for the Spinoza Habra, we've been working on putting to making a, 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 a Jewish adoption certificate and some other things we'd like to do for folks in that that category so if you're if that's who you are please be in touch with martin and my or myself um, i think most of you we have already been talking to but if you if you're wanting this but haven't talked to us please let us know we also know that people may be taking this class who are doing conversion in another movement or also through the shj's adoption and judaism program and those are all fine too but if there's any way we can support you in that please let us know as well Third, I'll mention that uh, we've also had some folks have expressed interest in doing an adult B mitzvah. And that would be where, um, and initially we had really thought we would do it as a class, but we really, Martin and I have talked about it more, we really would like to do a separate thing. So we will, around sometime in the high holiday season, we're going to have a special service, uh, kind of a celebration of the end of this class 
um, that everyone who's a participant in the class can participate in. But also, if you would like to be actually an adult bee mitzvah, uh, please let us know. What that would mean is, is that we would actually, in one of our regular Spinoza ser Havara services, we would call you to the Torah. But in our sense, since we aren't talking literally about a Torah scroll, it would be you bringing some of your Torah, your teaching, your understandings to us. And so you would have the chance to either do a, give a, a Devar Torah talk, to give a presentation. Um, <clears throat> there also might be some creative approaches, such as in the arts in some way. So if, that, if, if you're someone who wants to do something like that, please be in touch with us as well. Uh, we can start scheduling those maybe sometime this fall after the high holidays. But we would love to have, we really want to get as many people as possible engaged in different ways with what we do. So, and then last things as far as housekeeping issues, um, thanks to everyone who's been sending us course assignments. We really appreciate it. Please keep them coming. If you haven't done any of the course assignments yet, just a reminder, and I'll send you a link before the end of this session uh, about the where our, our class syllabus and class uh, resource page is. But if you can do those assignments over the next few months, really encourage you to do so, just to let you get as much out of the experience of being in this class as possible. <clears throat> and then finally, housekeeping-wise, our next class session will be on April 28th, and this one is going to be a good one. Martin is teaching, and the topic is Jewish languages. And to me, this is going to be a really exciting one, in part because Martin is, um, he's, He's a fiend for um, languages. He knows oodles of them. I need to ask him how many languages he's fluent in, but he's in fluent, fluent in quite a few of them, including some Jewish languages. So I'm really excited to hear what he's going to share on that, uh, especially, though, how language functions in Jewish culture and Jewish uh, religious life in different ways. And so I think it'll be a really, really good session. So looking forward to that a lot. OK, so with the housekeeping out of the way, what I'm going to do first, we talked about those videos. Let me pull them up real quick. And we'll do share screen. And, we'll, and these are just short little videos, but I think they're a good starting place for us before we enter into this conversation. Okay. So anyway, though, those two videos I thought might be a good uh, starting point for us as we enter into the conversation today. So what we'll be doing for the rest of our time together is, uh, let me pull up my notes real quick. I got too many things on the screen at one time. And, uh, da -da 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 -da. So in, the, in discussing today, um, I'm hoping that we can take these concepts of disagreements for the sake of heaven and this idea of active listening with us as we engage with these topics. Um, so a few things uh, also I'll mention, especially for those of you who are watching the recording, but let me ask you this. For those of you who are here today, how many of you were, were either got to listen to on recording or, or there live when Martin did his class on who is a Jew? Who, who got to hear that one? Okay, several of you. I think most of y'all did. Great. So that one, if you're if you're listening to this later recording, I really encourage you to go back and listen to that one first because that class to me builds some concepts that we're going to be talking about today. And so really, that would be very helpful if you're starting in this late. I would recommend watching that that class in particular. Um, so to begin with, in discussing um, this, uh, let me see if I can make this. So I can see my notes. And okay, there we go. One of the things that's important in discussing the, the, the topic of Israel, Zionism, and diaspora is we need to understand this is not a new controversy. It's often we think of it as a new controversy, but it is not. I would argue that this controversy has really been going on for 2,600 years at least. And what I mean by that specifically is we, we need to do a little bit of historical look back. If we look at what do we know of Jewish history uh, in the early, early days, of course, it's mythology. Most of what we read in Torah and Tanakh is, is a lot of that early stuff is mythology. We can't prove any of it happened or very little of it. What we do know 
from archaeology is we do see a point where there was a united kingdom of Israel with, da da with uh, David beginning a, getting a new monarchical um, dynasty. We see a little bit of archaeological evidence of this, a lot more from there onward. And so we see this united kingdom for a bit, but then very quickly we see it broken into two kingdoms, northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Both of these kingdoms having the same language, but with different accents, similar but different cultural and religious practices. They worshipped in different places, they did different things, but they still had some common cultural heritage. There was still commerce happening between them, cultural exchange happening. Then the northern kingdom was conquered. When that happened, many of the people of the northern kingdom were assimilated, but many others fled south to the southern kingdom of Judah. And when that happened, it really led in some ways to some pretty big theological innovations and also a lot of what we have now today in Jewish scriptures. The Tanakh comes from that time period of when now all these refugees are coming from the north to the south, and now there's kind of an, 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 an effort to try to make these two traditions uh, melt melge together. But then, not too long after that, another calamity happens. The Babylonians invade. They conquer Israel, or of course, con conquer Judah. They conquer Jerusalem, destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple. They send all the elite of the land to Babylon. And when that happens, Judaism, the religion of the people of Judah, has to have a reboot because there is no temple. How do we do things Jewishly without a temple? And so when that happened, this was beginning the very baby steps towards what would later become rabbinic Judaism about five, six hundred years later. So then um, in, in Babylon, they were there for about 70 years. And then the Babylonians were, were thrown out. The Persians took over. And then a new king of Persia, uh, Cyrus, well, actually, I should say emperor of Persia, allowed Jews to go back to the land, land of Israel to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. But, and this is where the controversy begins, the majority of the Jews who were sent to Babylon did not go back to Jerusalem. The majority stayed in Babylon. And, importantly, they stayed Jewish. That's, that's the key thing. Previous to that, remember the northern kingdom was conquered and people were sent into captivity in various places. Did they stay Jewish? As far as we know, not. In this case, <clears throat> with those who were first sent to Babylon, many of them stayed in Babylon, but stayed Jewish. And that began the controversy. And ever since then, the big debate is, what do we do? Who, where is our home? And there were Jews who said, you can't be really Jewish. You can't be fully Jewish unless you're in Israel. And other Jews said, who says so? I'm living a very happy Jewish life in Babylon or in Egypt or in Rome or any number of other places. And so that has been the ongoing debate. Now, over time, uh, in fact, you know, where this diaspora uh, Israel split really became pronounced, though, was after the, well, not pronounced, but the one of the major turning points again was the destruction of the Second Temple, the destruction of Jerusalem again. And now the further dispersing of Jews. And so now for the next um, good hundreds of years, there was a tiny population of Jews left in Israel. Most Jews lived in diaspora. The experience of diaspora became normative. It became what we think of today as we define what is Judaism. We primarily think of practices that happened in diaspora. That's where, for instance, the Babylonian Talmud came from from diaspora. And Talmud is where we get so many of our traditions of what we do as Jews, of why we do this holiday or that holiday. A lot of it goes to Talmud, it goes to diaspora. But as time continues to evolve, by the 1800s, we now see Jews responding to the vicious, vicious anti-Semitism in Europe and many other parts of the world, started proposing new solutions to this. And one of the solutions was the concept of Zionism, a return to the land of Israel. Now, in these early days, Zionism did not necessarily look like what we think of today. It often looked in many different formulations. For some, Zionism was a political movement. It was not about restoring the biblical kingdom of, of Israel. It wasn't about rebuilding a temple. It was about purely political cultural aspirations. Other people, it was religious. Other people, it was a mix of those things. 
For some people, there were other layers uh, on top. For instance, there was a very large socialist Zionist movement, for instance, and so that sought to bring to have this return to Israel, but from a socialist orientation. And so Zionism meant many different things in many contexts. And then we come to World War II, the Shoah, the Holocaust, and the resulting uh, result of that, and many, many, many other historical trends I'm not going to go into today um, that led to this, the founding of the modern state of Israel, and then the conflicts that have happened since then. There are no easy answers in any of this. And the the details, I'm, today I'm not focusing so much on the details. And part of the reason for that I'll mention is, is that for this class in particular, we are orient, we're seeking to orient our class to uh, humanistic Judaism, but also to Judaism in general and how to engage in Jewish communities wherever you might find yourself. And one of the things, remember, is that Jews, contrary to what some people might say, have not been united on this issue ever and certainly haven't more recently. Um, one example I'm going to share is actually from what the humanistic movement has to say on this issue. And so I'm going to share screen for a moment. Let me pull this link up real quick, because this was something that was put out from the Society of Humanistic Judaism, uh, started being put out fairly early on after the October of last year attacks from Hamas. And uh, it reflects a little bit of some of the where the movement is and what we'll what we'll find is that the movement is, is pretty divided. So let me do share screen real quick here. OK, so this is from the SHJ website. And it says, Humanistic Rabbis and Leaders on the 2023 Israel-Hamas War. And it's really, what I really focus on is the introductory note, which says, Please note, within the humanistic Jewish Judaism movement, we have the full diversity of political positions as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. SHJ refrains from official statements on issues where we cannot speak for a significant majority of our movement. Therefore, the following should not be taken as an official position. SHJ's goal as a movement platform is civil dialogue, empathy, and sharing. This is more effective in person in local communities among people who can draw upon ongoing supportive relationships and other commonalities when disagreeing on highly emotional issues. Online, we are willing to publish diverse opinions from our movement members and leaders. Below are statements by rabbis and leaders in the humanistic Judaism movement along with selected poems and liturgy that may be helpful in times of grief and pain. Broadly, we at SHJ are devastated by the fall 2023 events in Israel and Gaza and mourn the terrible loss of life. We hope for an end to the violence and a political resolution to the conflict soon. And then if you scroll down here, um, there is a broad range of viewpoints. Um, and just the ones I was able to scan through a little bit today we had um, one of the leaders from Cole Shalom, Shalom in Portland, Oregon, wrote a piece calling for a permanent ceasefire. Uh, Rabbi Sivan Moss uh, shared a statement that was that uh, the humanistic movement in Israel signed along with other progressive uh, Jewish organizations. Jeff Treisman wrote a piece and he spoke about the fact that he identifies as a pacifist, but now is really struggling with that concept. And then we had several piece, um, reflections and videos and whatnot from rabbis, uh, Adam Chalom and Rabbi Je Jeffrey Faylet. Oh, yeah. So uh, for each of these, and I share this, and I recommend really looking back. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat later for this particular thing. But I shared this just to say there is not a unified common perspective on this issue within humanistic Judaism. That said, I so and so I today I'm not here to tell you what the humanistic perspective is. I'm not even here to tell you what my perspective is. I have strong opinions, and I'm sure some of you do too. But at this moment, I don't think that's the important thing. Rather, what I think is the important thing is to understand a little better some of the the dynamics of this issue, but especially the emotional dynamics, because it helps us in engaging with other Jews who may disagree with us to understand where they're coming from and, and especially to see how that 
often common Jewish values, we, we still may come to different places, but we can still recognize some of the common Jewish values we might share in this. So let me look, pull up one thing on my notes real quick. And so um, one of the things I, I'll mention along these lines is that part of the reason this is important kind of de delving into this a little bit more is because many of us may choose either now or in the future to be part of more than one Jewish community. Uh, the Spinoza have, uh, we, we have a very specific humanistic orientation, but we also are very pluralistic. So you're going to hear very different points of view, and we all mostly get along most of the time. Not always, mostly. But I can, but other synagogues may be a very different experience. And often it is helpful to understand what might be driving people whose views are different than our own. And I'll give one very specific example from my own life. Um, in my Reform Temple, we have several, uh, here in Oklahoma City I'm a part of, we have several people there who are second or third generation descendants of Holocaust survivors. And for these people, for them, the state of Israel is not only miraculous, but it is, for them, it is a refuge. It is this sense of that no matter how bad things might happen, no matter where anti-Semitism may come up, wherever program may come in the future, there is a safety place. There is a place that I can go to and know that I will be accepted. For me, I have a hard time feeling that same sense of security because I know as a convert from the humanistic movement, I may or may not be accepted in Israel. I may or may not have that same, same experience if the same circumstances happened. For me, the, the challenging thing is I have to to be in fellowship with my, my friends, I need to understand for them why, how real this is, how tangible this refuge is, and how important it is, and even to respect what that is for them, even if I know it's not a refuge for me. Um, that's one example. There may be other examples, and this is where I wanted us to move into some, some conversation uh, to do some short breakout groups, to so talk through a little bit and really, for our first question, what I'd like to, and we'll probably have about two or three breakout sessions spending our time today. But the first one, I wanted to ask the question of what are the challenging questions you may be facing uh, on these issues, either in your family, your personal life, or in maybe other community contexts you're a part of. And especially also, who are, are there points of view that you've heard expressed that you at first glance didn't get, but later when you learned more, you did. So we're going to have about five, 10 minutes for this first breakout session. And so to talk through, just we invite everyone to share, if, if you feel comfortable doing so, something as far as what questions you have and also what are some issues you've seen, you've heard in other people that, that you'd like to understand better or that you have learned some more about. So let's, I'm going to set up the breakout groups. And also I mentioned for the breakout groups, we don't have the recording on for the breakout time. So feel free to speak as freely as you want. And I think we'll do, I guess we'll do, I think there's eight of us. So we'll, actually we'll do three breakout groups. And so there'll be either groups of three or, or two or three. So. Okay, well, how was the conversation? Uh, interesting. <laughs> for for Lori and I, it was pleasant, but I think that we had the benefit that in most respects we agreed. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I almost no no Lori, I genuinely appreciated speaking with you and 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 enjoyed it, but um, I I kind of almost wish I had had somebody who had a different viewpoint than my own. <laughs> Okay. So what about other groups? What were, what were your, your conversations like? Lots of common, commonalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that the relationship uh, for both of us has been one of complicated mixed feelings. 
mm -hmm. um, where we have going I back have, many yeah, many years many years me being uh zionist now neither nor but not willing to go into a double standard and also mm -hmm. feeling pain for my loved ones there and for the hopes for a, a but also understanding how hard i mean if i had been a, a palestinian would I, I i i wish i don't think i don't uh, if i had been a hamasnik but maybe i would have been you know uh, a complete anti-zionist again you know uh so it's kind of like uh you know feeling that that there's that injustices do not help take care of past injustices and how to deal with a situation where uh, so many values are shared, but so many others are so completely different, especially mm -hmm. for that, uh, that view it from very religious points of view mm -hmm. in both peoples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's it's I think the people I have the most challenges with are not well not the Sagmar people but the people who are uh, completely certain that they have the truth in their in their hands and can't see that the that life is more complicated and, and models mm -hmm are just the representations that we have of things. Uh, those are the people I have hardest part relating. You, mm -hmm. non-Zionist, anti-Zionist, all of them, if they are completely certain that they're, that they're right, it's hard for me to, to relate. Yeah. Uh, we talked about how we encountered people uh, you know, I mean, we, I think we were, we were probably on the same page, although David didn't talk about that, uh, didn't weigh in on that. But, but we talked about how dealing with other people in our lives and our worlds was difficult. And um, I just expressed that I, I was rather impressed by people uh, in authority who who tend to understand the nuances of everything and and we're giving a very balanced view. This isn't true of the average person. And yeah. um, and and then we talked a little about refuge and um and that kind of thing. But mostly I think we talked about how we who we how we encountered other people and how difficult that is. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Any other thoughts that that um, from the groups who would like to to share before we move on? Well, the so, next thing I'd like to do, and this is this is for us to practice some active listening. I found two videos that present very different points of view, but I chose specifically videos that I felt like that would have enough commonality with enough of us to maybe be resonant in some way. And I'm not, I, I will say from the get-go, I don't agree with these two videos completely, and you probably won't either, and that's okay. Um, what I'm sharing them for is, is for the practice of this active listening of engagement, but also to understand a little better how people that we may or may not agree with, how they think and how they engage. I also, though, purposefully chose videos that, and I will just, I'll just tell you that real quick, the two videos one is on the topic of can you be a Zionist and a progressive? And it was from the video series called Unpacked. The other video is called Anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism. Um, and so these two videos, I chose them really as conversation starters, but also because they are intention I intentionally did not choose extreme positions. Um, there are Zionist perspectives and anti-Zionist perspectives that many of us would be very troubled by in the way things are expressed. I didn't pick those. I picked ones that I thought would be um, within the range of, well, I'm just hoping they'll be be, be helpful. So um, so we'll go ahead and play. the. These are both relative. They're a little bit longer, those earlier ones, but still relatively short. And I think there's some good stuff here. 
And then after that, we'll do another series of breakout rooms. I'll probably mix it up, though, just for fun to see if we can see what, what kind of conversation comes mixing up the groups. So let me go ahead and share screen real quick, and then we'll start queuing up. Okay, those two videos, I chose them because they, they did have very different points of view, but also I think raises some important questions, some important issues, and I thought it might be a great way to lead us into our next time of conversation. So um, what for, for our prompts for the next James? section? Yes. Sorry. Um, will the links for both those videos be in the recording of this? or Yes, and, yeah, and I'll also put them in the chat now. Uh, so okay, they're, they're excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I'm just going to put in the chat to just one thing I had um, just as far as kind of um, I'm going to put in the chat another set of links here. And they're actually for some Wikipedia articles. Um, and I actually recommend them because they actually do a halfway decent job of explaining some of the complexity of Jewish response, Jewish responses in these issues, so include the article on Jewish diaspora, the article on Zionism, an article on non-Zionism, and an article on anti-Zionism. And so, um, just encourage you when you have chance to look through them, just to kind of get oriented to just to see the the absolute diversity of views on these issues and how complicated it can be. So, for our, our next thing, I think our next. A bit of a breakout time. My suggestion of for questions for us to engage with one would be, what do we see in the people we dis? In other words, if you're my my challenge to you is if you are a Zionist, to ask yourself what in the views of the anti-Zionist do you do you see as a point of connection? If you're an anti-Zionist, what is it in the Zionist that you might see as a point of connection? I know this is a stretch, but I think that there's value in engaging with people different than ourselves. And so that's the first challenge is, is there something in the views of the other that you find helpful or admirable, even if you might disagree with other elements? The second piece of it is, is that get, the question I have is that given this level of diversity, given how many views there are and how wi widely wide apart they are, um, what are your thoughts on how we can still engage together given this diversity? And, and how does the Jewish community stay in conversation? How do we work through those? So those are our discussion questions for our breakout rooms. And we'll see if I can make it so it'll shuffle them up this time a little differently. Okay. Well, who would like to share from your group? Uh, what, um, how, how did it go? And did we mix it up a little bit this time? Let's. I hope so. We'll see. So I we never want to talk. I never want to talk to Paula and Betty Ann ever again. Just yes. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I, 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 I have to say, we got a little we, heated. <laughs> we we rolled the dice, and even though Lori and I ended up in the same group again. Uh, it was wrong of me to assume, but I thought Paula and Betty Ann uh, were going to be in lockstep with me, and we weren't, and that's okay. That's all right. I I enjoyed our I enjoyed our heated dialogue. Good. I thought we were more. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny. It skips so, it skips so why I don't I don't talk very much usually. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, did anyone find things admirable about the people you disagree with? I really <laughs> like. We didn't find oh. them unadmirable. We, didn't, what, <laughs> we were really disagreeing. I think we were giving our personal experiences. I think. But but tell me what 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 did what did Skip say that we wouldn't agree with? No, I, I don't think, well, he said he wasn't a Zionist, but that doesn't matter. 
we, we, weren't <laughs> about that. we weren't arguing about that. We were just talking about, well, we talked a lot about the sister of Salam Shalom and the experience, mm -hmm. experience we had there, unfortunately, with the But Skip uh, didn't Muslim, agree, but, yeah. you did, but you disagreed with with we we agreed that we dis uh, um well first of all admirable um i i uh, i the first thing i want to call out is paula's passion i love the, how passionate you are for this i think that passion is actually important <laughs> I, I think i think passion is important even as long as we r remain respectful and civil but um but uh our disagreement i think surrounded um the well, the 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 main thing that I took issue with, um, you know, that I had some umbrage over was uh, the right of the United Nations, Great Britain, and the United States oh, to mm -hmm. to divide mm -hmm. the land. That was interesting. Yes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is an interesting. That's point. an interesting point. And mm -hmm. that's why we didn't. Uh, no, we didn't necessarily feel we were at odds with. I mean, I brought that part, thing up, but then Skip pointed out that not everyone thinks that that was. That they had the right to do it. Yeah, we didn't really have time to get into it, but I had wanted to bring up that the fact that Israel is not. They always say settler colonialism, but Israel is. I think one of you pointed it out that Israel is not in the same situation because it's not like white Europeans going into Africa, for example. That there's that connection, so it's not really as simple. It's a lot more complex than that verbiage. Yes. So when someone uses terms like settler colonialism. Apartheid state, I immediately kind of shut down because it's like, if I feel like they're rattling off words that don't are abstract issues to them. You know, it's hard for me to talk to that. Although I I may agree in principle, I just have trouble. It makes me feel like, do they have a personal connection to the issue, or are they just rattling off verbiage they heard in their progressive circles? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Well, not to mention that it could have been it, uh, Herzog was willing to to take the movement to Uganda. So, and I say, listen, uh, we're lucky that or been. not. I don't know, but 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 yeah. Uh, so, um, the one thing that I well that I found not so much admirable, but that I could find connection was the fact that both the anti-Zionist, this anti-Zionist, and the Zionist uh, are talking, they, they are affected what happens there. I mean, I, I think that for many uh, Jewish people who either are Zionist or, they, they don't know much of what's going on there, but also don't feel a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that when I was Zionist and, and now that I'm uh, whatever, uh, it's it's the same as whatever's going on there also affects me because I might not be uh, uh, Jewish enough to be married by a rabbi, but I'm Jewish enough to be killed by, by Hitler. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I and also I have people there. I care and I care. I care about justice, but also the fact that when anyone speaks about Jews, I I feel triggered, even if they are talking about people who, whom I don't agree at all with. And I have uh, actually lots of uh, hot disputes, if at all. Uh, but but I know. I mean, when the other day there was someone who was count, a counter protest to some some guys with uh, Israeli, uh, and someone started saying, "Oh, you won't be safe because you kill you kill Jesus." And I said, "Oh my goodness, oh. Well, Palestinians do not need that kind of allyship, you know." Yeah. Well, and uh, Gabriel, you're you're speaking exactly to something that I. We haven't touched on yet, but we, we the second video touched on Zionism amongst Christians, particularly American Christians, mm -hmm. and that is a whole different problematic. But oh, okay. um, right now, what a weird situation we are in, where progressives who who um, 
are, you know, doing pro-Palestinian protests or anti-Israeli government protests, sorry, um, are, uh, you know, they are um, finding conservatives who believe in, and no offense to conservatives, I'm, I'm calling out a specific group here, conservatives mm-hmm. who believe in conspiracy theories mm-hmm. are are aligning with them. And I am like, no, stay away from me. That is disgusting. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I think the fact that you, James, talk about the trepidation, which I also felt uh, uh, about the this, talks about how uh, even if one says, well, it doesn't have anything to be with me in my personal life, it's still even if you don't know anyone there it still affects you right so yeah. it's, it's kind of like in the way like i don't have any when george floyd got murdered i don't have that personal connection but yet as a justice seeking person i wanted to be you know to be well supportive i mean it's you know you don't necessarily have to have the connection but it's not the same thing as having the connection mm-hmm I will say the longer that I've engaged on this issue, the more it has become clear to me that I'm very uncomfortable with the binaries of Zionist and Mm anti-Zionist. I really don't fit well into either of those bubbles. Um, And if I think about over the last six months, who's given me more heartburn? I'm not sure which of those camps has given me more heartburn, but I've I've really become frustrated with both of them, to be honest. Um, A lot of the... I'm involved in a lot of leftist organizing in various ways and i was really shocked by some of the really poorly worded statements put out by organization i'm a part of right after the the october 7th attacks and uh, at the same time i also have been very frustrated with uh, some zionist perspectives that erase the palestinian people deny that they exist um speak of them in openly racist ways um and I, I think I'm coming back to the place of saying at the end of the day, at least for me, I I want to center real people instead of just political ideas, and which means for me, it's working, trying to find ways to work for the well-being of Palestinian people and Israeli people and keeping coming back to that. Because I, I just don't, I, to me at least, I can't, I have too many friends on both. I mean, I have too many friends, Palestinian Americans who I'm close to here in Oklahoma City. One of the, there are many, are, most prominent imam locally is a Palestinian American, and he's had five members of his family so far being killed in Gaza. Mm-hmm. But I also have lots and lots of people I now know and friends of friends I know in Israel, and they're terrified for good reasons. And I, I don't know. This this dispute has convinced me that the binary is does at least for me. I I I think it's a problem. It feels for me like asking me to pick. Do I support Palestinians or Israelis? It's like cutting my heart in two. Yes. And I just say I'm on the don't kill children side, no matter who those children are. But it's hard because people keep wanting me to take sides and not care about half of the people. Yeah. Well, well, I was convinced, and, and, and I still do, the thing is that you couldn't be pro-Palestinian and anti-Jewish. Uh, a good pro-Palestinian being, and at the same time, you can't be a good pro-Jewish and even pro-Israel if you are anti-Palestinian. I'm saying Palestinian in the most uh, general sense because you have both uh, Christians and Muslims and also people who are more secular, less secular, whatever. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because the but again, uh, it's. I, I feel ambivalence. I I know that if life had been, have gone in another direction, I would have been one of the people seen that had been, that was attacked. So it's kind of like I know people there, <laughs> and, yeah. and mm-hmm. so it it, it uh, when I was young, the only way for me to be Jewish in a secular way was to be 
Zionist. Mm -hmm. So, but socialist Zionist, yes, because I I believe in I was against poverty, love, and injustice. Against the, uh, unlike the rest of your squares, if you have heard to Tomer, if you haven't, you should. You get a kick out of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I wouldn't. I realized what the deal was with the the sisterhood. Um, they were holding us responsible for Netanyahu, but we were not asking them to be responsible for Hamas. Maybe they would have wanted to be. I don't know. I hope not. But we were not asking them to be responsible for the the bad actions of anyone on their side. But they mm -hmm. would want us to be responsible for in the bad actions on our side that we have no control over whatsoever. And that I, you know, that I think was ultimately the nature of the problem. And they stopped coming to the meetings. They, they stopped, but they, something about the going online during the pandemic, they also stopped coming to that. So I don't know, it, it got fell mm -hmm. apart. When we started coming together outside, it, it, it didn't work out. Yeah. Well, was, we're at, at, I'll go what, ahead, Paul. But what did the third group talk about? Talk about? Phyllis, David, David, David. I'm. Um, go ahead. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I think one of the most helpful ways of finding a common ground is for people to stop equating a country's politics with that country. Um, you know, what Hamas does is not representative of all Palestinians. What Israel's government does is not representative of all Israelis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that all people have some experience of, no matter what country you live in. I'm pretty sure that at some point you will have lived under a government that you disagree with because it's not possible for a government to 100% represent all of its people. It just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how come in this instance, everyone's always like, okay, <laughs> this represents that country, but it, it simply doesn't, you know? You can support Israel's right to exist without necessarily agreeing with, you know, everything the Israeli government does, or maybe some of it, maybe other parts, not so much. Mm -hmm. And the same way for Palestine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That also, yeah. So, it's like if everyone thought that, that, oh, you're an American, so you must love Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Or support his policies. Yeah. Um, he was our president. I I guess so. Uh, I've got somebody mowing the lawn outside, so I've been trying to keep my things so I'm like, but anyway, um, give it a shot here. Um, I think one of the bigger things about this that concerns me that in some ways I feel blurs the line between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is the fact that this part of the world, this conflict that Israel is a part of is being singled out Partly, I th you think, or mainly because it's U.S. money and funds going toward it. But maybe just say, hey, stop. I mean, people are saying stop funding Israel or giving them the, the uh, equipment. So, but where are all these people, the leftists and this and that, all these do-gooders and justice seekers and peacemakers, when it comes to Ukraine and Russia and Yemen and Sudan and Ethiopia and Haiti and for the Uyghurs? And they're Rohingya and Bhutan. So there is still this, and of course the media, the media is uh, really key in all this. You know, what gets covered, what gets seen, who's got eyes on what, who's putting eyes on what, who's sharing eyes on what. So, you know, that that's landscape is concerning to me. And that's one of the things that's hmm. big for me. Well, thank you for bringing that up. I think we, the conversation surrounding anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is one that really just has to be ongoing. But 
Um, I two two things that I would say in response to you, not to be contentious, but just as alternative perspectives are one, not all leftists, um, as we saw in the video, are you know of this position or. Um, are ignoring this conflict and not all leftists are the only ones that are protesting as I called out we've got some pretty crazy people believing theories amongst the right and the, the left unfortunately but um, you know I, I labeled myself I chose to label myself as an anti-Zionist um, and uh, hold on a moment here I gotta switch audio um Okay, and one second here. Okay, all right. So, I um, I, cho I chose to label myself as an anti-Zionist because, as the the video on critical thinking or and um, you know, dialogue in society, civil dialogue in society, called out um, active listening um, as well. Uh, the definitions of terms that we use are important also. And I know that some would choose not to agree with my um, my definition, uh, but I choose to define anti-Zionism um, not as being against Israel's right to uh, self-determination. I'm actually for that, but rather to be um, someone who is critical of the occupation of Palestinian lands and and um you know where they resided and and what ensued afterwards um and and also i'm somebody that that does not buy into the to the the majority of the justifications that have been used for um jews to occupy the land that does not include having a safe space to be clear i do believe that jews just as all people um, you know, deserve to have a safe space. And that is part of self-determination. And so when you hear me label myself as anti-Zionist, it is not, again, it is not against the existence of an Israeli state. That's interesting. Yeah. I feel the same. And I would also say in uh, response about comparing this to other conflicts in the world, First of all, our government has been incredibly supportive of Ukraine versus Russia. So there, the need for protests in support of Ukraine w was not there. Um, we sent billions of dollars and we have been sending billions of dollars aid to them. Um, it is very different between the Ukraine-Russia conflict and this one. They're, they're just not comparable, I don't think. Um, and same with like the Uyghurs. We didn't do as much, but it was still our government spoke out against that. Um, and I have been to several marches in support of Palestinians and um, the in support of Sudanese and Yemeni, Ye Yemeni people are also very prevalent in those places. So those are being talked about. But I do think that the biggest difference here is that the amount of money that we are sending, the amount of supplies that we are sending um, to that end up killing Palestinians. I think that is why it is such a, a hot topic and such a touch point for uh, leftists in the West. It, it's hard to separate because Israel needs defensive weapons, absolutely needs that. But as to offensive weapons and how they're being deployed. Exactly. Like Iron Dome, I have no problem with that. Let's supply that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Forever so, yeah. and ever. I have no, no issue with that. You don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. What was the name of that um, that AI system that they're using to yeah. actually oh, God, I can't to, to target? Oh, yeah. God. Oh, okay. Well, that was, you know, Bernie Sanders, I really appreciate. He he His position was stop the offensive weapons, continue the Iron Dome. And yeah. I, yep. for me, I absolutely agree. I think that's something I think is pretty universal. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say universal, but I think most many people who are opposed to sending offensive weapons do see the, I mean, to me, what happened last night um, with the uh, Iran missile attacks and they were shot down so effectively. Uh, that's wonderful. And I, yeah. Yeah. Though, though, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, I, I, I'm, I've always if I have a sin is of being too pacifist, really. So I, I, I have a, I've never been in a war myself. 
and uh, I've always wondered what would uh, what would happen to me if I lived there. No, I have very good friends that went that we were together in the in the kibbutznik movement when we were young, and some of them live there. Some of them are are as disenchanted with Zionism as I am. Uh, but uh, I haven't, and though I have spoken to with them, uh, of course, what happened in October has shocked them also. Uh, even if they they still work with uh, the coexistence movement and the trying to reform uh, society along with uh, Arab Israelis or Palestinian Israelis. I don't know how they define themselves, but it's, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, uh, it's, I, I think this has been, it's one of the reasons I, I was so happy when I found you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, Gee, I can talk with people who have the same mixed feelings and also, but also who, who don't come up with, you know, this messian, messianic explanations for why they're for or against. I mean, both of them, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can understand them, but I can't uh, relate with to them. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the problems of uh, thinking there's a God of history is that you end up uh, justifying everything that happens in history. And that uh, doesn't leave any room for us to do something really uh, to change it. So. I, I think one thing I learned here is that you can't assume, you know, when someone uses a word like Zionism or whatever, you can't just, you know what they mean by that. I mean, yes. I listen to Skip's very calm, very uh, nuanced, uh, Opinion of what that, and I would not have guessed that. Uh, and so you really have to ask someone what do they mean by what they're saying. And that's what I mostly learned here that we make assumptions about when people use certain language, and we really need to investigate that more because, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, I, so that reminds me of that I, you know, I have this friend who only listens, has no Jewish history, basically. I mean, she was raised Jewish, but nominally nominally you know a few holidays i think so she listens to social media with a you know whatever's on tv she watches whatever channels and so she like became an anti-zionist and i was like it was like so shocking and it was um so i was trying to talk to her about it and people take really hard stands based on very limited knowledge because i studied modern Zionism and modern, you know, Judaism and taught for 35 years. And, and I, you know, Jewish history in general, or biblical studies, et cetera. So um, the Holocaust, there's so many different varieties of Zionism, you know, that came up in the 1800s, mainly late 1800s. Um, you know, social, social Zionism, labor Zionism, religious Zionism, mm -hmm. everybody had like a whole different <laughs> like movement. There was all these different Zionist movements, you know? <laughs> so, so that's what is sort of like shocking for me. It's like, whoa, wait, how do you, you, you know, you have to define, how do you define Zionism? So I always have to ask everybody, well, okay, let's have a conversation about this. Let's learn about Zionism. Um, so, um, so sometimes I think there's this rush to judge and I would like to see us talking more and learning about each other more, which reminds me also of these articles I've read in recent months about some of the problems with Holocaust education, because there's been this focus on Holocaust education and then, but not really on sharing Jewish culture. I mean, there are a couple of big Jewish history museums now. I think there's one in Philadelphia that's supposed to be great, but, you know, tell the cultural side of Judaism too, or Jews, not just don't talk about dead Jews. Let's talk about Jewish culture. Well, some of it does include that, but, you know, share holidays with them, whatever. 
So, um, my lawnmower. The, the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia has a lot of culture in it, a lot of baseball and all kinds of great stuff. <laughs> yeah, they have a good bookstore too. Yeah, yeah, a good gift shop too. Yeah, one beautiful gift shop. Mm -hmm. yeah. What what part of Philadelphia is that? Center City. It's right on. Um, yeah, off Market Street, probably. It's it's right near. It's sort of near the river, Delaware River. Mm. It's near the Liberty Bell. It's like right, almost right across from the Liberty yeah, Bell. it's like the block yeah, next to it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. They just well, did a book um, renovation too. I don't. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the guy that says something non secular, but I think I will anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go. Uh, I want to say that as somebody who's not ethnically Jewish and has never prior previously been culturally Jewish um, or religiously, um, uh, that, uh, you know, I thought I had my bearings on anti-Semitism. But th this past year, Jewish year, um, uh, has been the first time that I felt even a very small inkling of fear of anti-Semitism. And... Um, and specifically when I decided to put my menorah in the window of my home. And now I live in the suburbs in kind of a secluded area. And so I don't really have, honestly, much to fear. But nevertheless, I still worried because I am surrounded by some people who might hate Jewish people. And and I can't, I don't know. I don't know. And and I was, uh, the I had the very smallest bit of trepidation and and I didn't think that I would because I'm somebody who's a fighter. And so I'd be ready to go toe to toe with somebody who's an anti-Semite. And, and so when I talk about Zionism, you know, I'm somebody that has been, I think, resolute about, you know, Israel, Palestine, et cetera. And, and my views were somewhat established some, some years back after I became much more progressive. But becoming a humanistic Jew is the first time that I have like I've stepped back and actually looked at the real anti-Semitism that emerges amongst anti-Zionists and against, uh, or, you know, those that are engaging in pro-Palestinian um, protests. It's the first time that I've actually been like, hold on a moment. That's not okay. That's an anti-Semitic thing to say. And, and you are making Jews afraid. You're making Jews think that they should hate themselves and and it's just it's 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 terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It hasn't changed my mind from a political perspective, but uh, this is the first time that I've I can honestly say, and I'm somebody that has been anti or has been against anti-Semitism for quite some time. Yeah, my experience is very similar to yours. Um, I was not aware of how much anti true anti-Semitism there was in leftist spaces until after the the October attacks. Um, and it's real. And I and what surprised me was such thoughtful people that I believed were thoughtful and nuanced would post memes and whatnot on social media that had like obvious um anti like like cartoon images of supposed Jews with the with uh, crooked noses and things like that. And oh my to God. me, I just kept thinking this how's this this is like blackface this is i mean i just it seems so deeply offensive and it, to me it was so obviously offensive and yet it obviously wasn't and so that was a wake-up call and yeah it's a very real wake-up call absolutely it's interesting because no one becomes black voluntarily i mean you want even if you want mm -hmm. to you can't do that but you can become jewish mm -hmm. <clears throat> you don't know what it feels like to always have been jewish but you start to get when you're around more Jews who were always Jewish, you start to understand that there's something there that you didn't get because how could you have, you know? Absolutely. Well, and I think to some extent, the process of, of Jewish conversion in part is becoming identified with this other community and then beginning to actually personalize it. That now, and, and for me now, I mean, I'm coming back to a situation in Israel for me, what now has complicated things deeply is half of the world's Jews live in Israel. And whatever I think of their politics, half of the world's Jews live in Israel. I have to care about those people because I'm Jewish. Um, it, there's layers to this. And um, I think that we have to stay very open and ready well, to let you, those things affect us. I think you think you're just converting to another religion. Mm-hmm. 
and you're but not. It's like it's more. Neighborhood. <laughs> because once you identify as Jewish, you have to take on that other. Bit. Mm-hmm. I will say I went to a, on, you know, in a sense, yeah. you can understand. No, what it was. Um, well, I've seen that. It's and it's it's on all sides. I won't say both sides because I agree the binary does not work here. Um, there's so many different sides to the, to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went to a, a march recently, in which a man decided to get up and start speaking, and he. I agreed with a lot of what he said, and then he got to the point where he said, "And the Jews are doing this, and the Jews are doing that." And I will say, first of all, I was very uncomfortable. Um, obviously, it was just blatant anti-Semitism right there. Even though I agree with some of the things he said, was saying, it was very hard for me to like reason with it. Um, but I also then felt really fantastic because I was there in a shirt that said Jews for like, not in our name, like one of the Jewish Voice for Peace shirts. So I was very clearly stating that I was Jewish on my shirt. Um, and the swiftness with which the organizers shut him down at that point mm-hmm. felt really good. Yeah. And they were then they were not Jewish organizers. They were they were Palestinian Muslim and Muslim organizers, and they shut him down. And it felt really good. Um, and then on the other side, again, sorry, on another side, not the other side. Um, I have cousins in Israel, and one of them posted a really atrocious comment talking about how Muslims are a threat to democracy and that they will not, I think they, he, they will not go silently to the, to the freight carts or something like that. Freight cars, like mm-hmm. really, really racist, awful, vile things coming from P- Jew, my Jewish family in Israel. So it is very much not only anti-Semitism at play. Um, I have, I have honestly, personally seen more anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian rhetoric, at least that isn't then taken down immediately or like combated immediately, then I have seen anti-Semitic rhetoric that is not challenged immediately. I think it does vary a lot from local communities, but I would say in Oklahoma City, I've been very impressed with the the Palestinian solidarity movement of very much policing the the protests and shutting down anti-Semitic rhetoric when it happens. Uh, Now, here's where it gets complicated. It's all about interpretation, though. Uh, There's things like the slogan from the river to the sea that can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, That's the kind um, that's where it gets more complicated. But what I have been pleased with is some of the more outright overt anti-Semitic stuff. They shut it down very quickly. And I wish I could say the Jewish community here was as zealous about protecting Muslims, they are not. They they try. Uh, a rabbi it does a great job. Uh, not, I wouldn't say it's a universal at all. So it's it's an ongoing thing. Um, in Philadelphia, I found myself really at home in this Quaker-led interfaith ceasefire vigil that happens every week because they were very inclusive. For example, they when someone at an earlier rally said from the river to the sea, the organizer talked to them and said, you can't say that here. You cannot say that here. And I felt seen. I felt like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm not going to encounter anti-Semitism. And um, it just felt good. Um, I mean, they were sensitive because they wanted to be inclusive. Um, and it's important. Absolutely. Well, looking at the time, we this has been a fantastic class, but we've gone about 24 minutes when we were supposed to end. <laughs> so I think we're going to go ahead and call it for this being the, the class session. We can leave the Zoom open for a little bit longer. But I just really just want to say again how much I appreciate y'all showing up. I, 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 I know this one's been a lower attendance than the others, and I think probably for good re- people have been nervous. So uh, for those of you, th- for those of you who are there in person, I appreciate you being here because it gave us a conversation. And I'm hoping for those w- those watching and recording later, it'll be meaningful to them and to know that we don't all agree, and that's okay. We can keep talking. We can keep working for justice and peace and understanding that um, that we our hearts are. It's 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 challenging to 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 be a human being, and it's challenging to be a Jewish human being. But we have to keep trying. So. Anyway, I just want to thank everyone again for participating. 
And um, just a reminder, in two weeks, Mark will be talking about Jewish languages, and it should be a really good session. So I hope you'll get to be there for that. So 